So with that, welcome to my speech. Uh, thanks for joining me today. I'm going to be talking about open source resilience and growth, basically how to create communities that thrive. And hold on, let me make sure I go to the next slide. Before diving into the talk, oh, okay, sorry, there's a lag for me. Um, I wanted to introduce myself in case you don't already know me. My name is Naritzi Sanchez, and I am a senior open source program manager at GitLab. I joined there in February. And before that, I was actually um, one of the founding team members at Endless, which is a company that created a Linux-based um, operating system for users with little to no access to internet. And that's how I got introduced to free and open source software um, and how I got introduced actually to the GNOME community and uh, ended up contributing more to that and am a former president and chairperson at the GNOME uh, Foundation. And I also wanted to include a little bit about my academic background since I don't know if it's as common to find in free and open source software. I studied international relations and psychology in undergraduate, and that's the lens through which I see um, the world. All right, so in this talk, I'm going to be covering a few different topics. The first half of this presentation is going to be about resilience and growth and some opportunities that I see for the KD Foundation and really all open source software projects. And then the second half of this presentation is going to be about collaborative communication, because I think it's really an, a really important skill to build. Okay, so uh, resilience and growth, um, basically this year has been really tough, and it's included us all, our personal lives, our professional lives, and our open source communities. There has been a pandemic, there have been wildfires, there have been um, issues with racial and social justice. Um, we've had to um, change our perspective. And there's been, uh, through the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, fight through lots of issues um, that are being surfaced in all areas of our personal and professional life. Um, and there's mass unemployment. And in our open source organizations, there's uh, the lack of in-person events has really changed things for us. It means that we haven't had as many hackathons or sprints that are vital to the progress of our projects. And our human connection aspect has somewhat suffered in that it's been great to be part of this virtual conference and chatting is really fun. I've seen you know some really funny conversations happen, but it would be a whole other level to meet you all in person. And so uh, what I wanted to talk about is just resilience. Um, it means the ability to bounce back. And when looking through the American Psychological Association's website, I found this framework that they have about resilience and how you have to take time and really be intentional about building each of these four, four focus areas, which are meaning, wellness, healthy thinking, and connection. And so I wanted to take this lens and apply it to the KDE community and open source communities in general. So really see what kind of opportunities we have in each of these focus areas. Um, and before I move on, I just wanted to see if you all are having problems with latency in my talk uh, slides because I'm getting quite a bit of lag. Any looking at the public chat? It seems good. It seems OK. OK, great. So I'll keep going. All right. And please forgive me if you hear me pause for a little bit because I see a blank slide. OK, so the first focus area is meaning. And for that, it's really about helping your community understand why it is that we're all here. And to that, um, in fact, I think the KDE does a really good job, uh, has a very clear and powerful vision, um, clearly stated on a web page. It says that 
Katie imagines a world in which everyone has control over their digital life and enjoys freedom and privacy. And they also have a mission statement where it provides in-depth information on how to actually achieve that vision statement. And so I think that is a fantastic start. And I think that there's an opportunity to keep uh, bringing that meaning to more people. And so I see an opportunity around building the brand, the marketing, and doing more outreach to the community. And I love this quote by Robert McKee that really says that storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today. And I think that um, you know, early on, a lot of FOSS projects started off with really strong developer communities. And we've started to see the importance of building out other aspects, um, bringing in other skill sets. And I'd like to encourage KBE and us all to keep moving in that direction. I think it's awesome that they've um, employed contractors to help with brand and marketing and community. Um, this event is being run by incredible organizers, some of which are paid staff. Um, and I think that that's a really great way to ensure that the project is resilient and continues to, to grow. The next focus area is wellness. And when I think of wellness in the open source sense, I think about measuring the health of the community. And um, at the GNOME Foundation, I know that we haven't done um, a lot of uh, data collection, partly because of privacy concerns. And I think that KD is similar, where it's either, you know, there were real concerns to be um, and challenges to that, that we face. Um, and then part of it is just like, maybe we don't have the skill set or expertise to really put this in place. And so I think that this is an area where we can all grow is um, because people want to understand the projects that they're engaged with. For example, companies need to understand the value of the project and the impact that their contributions make. And open source foundations like KDE can evaluate the impact that their programs, that their work is, is having as they uh, respond to their community's needs. And so the opportunity here is to start measuring our success and measuring our community's health. We all have annual reports where we do, but this is taking it to the next level. And for that, there is a project that exists today called the Chaos Project. If you haven't heard about it, uh, please check it out. It is focused on developing metrics and practices to help organizations measure their community's health. And KDE and GNOME are collaborating on setting on creating a set of metrics specifically for our foundations. Uh, I'm part of the working group. It's called the App Ecosystem Working Group. It's an open, you know, group to join. So if you'd like to check us out, I've included a link there. And uh, if you are part of another open source project, I encourage you again to check out Chaos because I think it's a really great um, thing to, to look into as we continue to mature our organizations. The next factor is healthy thinking. And to me, this is all about policies and programs and kind of like how we are enabling our community from a high level perspective. And I love that KDE's mission statement includes this people-centric um, bit that says that in order to promote the development of free and open source software, KDE maintains a diverse, inclusive, and safe community. So KDE is specifically calling this out that the people aspect is important. Um, and I think that's that's important because it uh, then enables you to fund projects or programs that are specific to helping make sure that that happens. As I mentioned before, paid staff, I think that that's a really important thing to consider. And that could be full time or contractors. But I think that um, having somebody there that sees the uh, you know, organization evolve that um, is paid and dedicated to the project is, um, you know, to work on the project is really important. Um, we at GNOME have um, even hired a full-time um, developer to work on GTK and, um, you know, other aspects, a sysadmin um, were, look, 
we have somebody who's helping with fundraising, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, we're still in the experimental phase at GNOME in terms of understanding, um, you know, how how many people to employ and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think it's a really important step to be taking. And then sustainability in general. Uh, one of the things here is that I, I'm not sure that we do a great job of collaborating with others to the degree that we could be collaborating. Um, I was part of this organization called FOSS Responders that came into being um, to support organizations during COVID-19 because, um, you know, because of the lack of in-person events, we thought that they would be, that projects would be financially impacted. And I was just amazed at how many amazing people there from like the Python Foundation and uh, Drupal Association and all these other ones that I know, you know, I, I know that they're there. I know that, I ex that they exist and we meet at um, events, but we don't do enough collaboration. And I think that there's that's a key area and a healthy way of thinking is like, how can we continue to collaborate with more open source projects and really think about this from the ecosystem point of view? Um, and I just want to, in case you haven't heard about it, there's this um, group called Sustain OSS. I have the link here. Um, and it's a lot of people from different associations, from companies that have open source um, program offices that all get together to talk about sustainability. Um, and the opportunity here for KDE and other organizations is that we think about also a broader set of skills and more diversity in open source. And with this, I mean going beyond normal non-code contributions, which are usually like documentation or translation outreach, but really challenging ourselves to think even further. For example, someone might be interested in building skills for sales or business development, or they might have that expertise. They would be great for fundraising or partnerships teams here at open source, you know, at Katie and, and other open source projects. Or people who have HR and people skills or expertise. They'd be great for engagement teams, boards of uh, board of directors, or newcomers initiatives. So again, let's think even beyond just the normal non-code contributions and do outreach into those areas. The final focus area is connection. And this is all about people, people-focused programs. I think social events are crucial to the health of communities. And I was so happy to see that here at Academy, we have a couple of um, social events coming up. I've included links here just in case you haven't already signed up. I'm signed up for one of the escape rooms and really excited about it. And I think it's really important to have these regular social interactions so that you keep building um, relationships with the people that you're working with. It really helps newcomers feel connected, people who are already part of the community to feel motivated to continue to contribute. And I think it's it's great to remember that we're a global community. So time zones and uh, like the way that you connect um, is really important. Um, some people may not have great internet connections. So maybe a chat based thing might be more useful in certain situations versus maybe video would be better in others. So thinking about all those things. Um, onboarding initiatives, I think that's really important for the connection, having a, a, some sort of a personal touch might be great to incorporate into such a thing. Um, and I love that Katie is thinking about this. Um, I know that the, the move to GitLab was actually part of this, where you're thinking about the newcomer's experience and the types of tools that will help make it easier for people to contribute. Um, so I want to encourage that con um, continuation to think about um, the people first. And again, um, I think that it's really important not just to focus on the technical skills that our community has, but also um, the, the people skills. And so having people-oriented training on things like implicit bias, which I know happened earlier at Academy, and I'm bummed that I missed out. Um, we at GNOME had this code of conduct training for events teams so that they know how to handle complaints and to actually implement a code of conduct. Um, and things like collaborative communication, which is what the rest of this presentation will be about. 
I think it's really important to build in these people skills into a community in order to make them resilient and in order to enable just collaboration in general. Okay, so as I mentioned, the rest of this is going to be around collaborative communication. And if you've seen some of my other talks this year, this will be um, a pretty condensed version and um, it won't have all of the topics, but I hope you'll still learn something today for um, people new to this topic. I'm going to start off with some of my favorite hacks, and these are ones that I really would love everybody in the world to know. The first is that it is the writer's job to be understood. And for this, it, formatting really helps. So I know that sometimes when we're writing um, issue descriptions or anything else, we sometimes we have bullet points. And sometimes bullet points even, like we think that that's good formatting, but it can end up looking like a wall of text. So here you'll notice that I have bullets, but I've actually bolded the first item to kind of give you a sense of what the rest of the bullet will be. And that really helps somebody be able to skim through it and understand like what they're most interested in or be able to refer back to it later. Um, so that's a really handy thing, doing a skim test. Also making sure that you understand what if you have a call to action and what that is, make it really clear. Um, make sure to state who needs to do it and by when. Try to avoid long sentences, break them up if at all possible. And then do not assume previous knowledge. Make sure that it's easy for anybody to just jump right in. And this might even be thinking about like the acronyms that you're using or just the terminology that you're using. Um, it might end up excluding others. So make sure that you think through it through that lens of making sure that anybody can jump right in. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of us are, you know, spending time writing things and issues and, and communicating via uh, merge requests or other things that are development oriented. And um, I think that formatting is really important there. Here's an example of an issue that our social team actually uh, created at GitLab where when you have, um, this is an issue template, so whenever you have a request for them, you can easily go through all of the steps they need you to fill in and be able to submit it. Um, and here you see that they've made use of different titles, of, um, of check boxes, of emoticons, and all of this really helps you be able to perform the tasks that they need you to. So I, I want us all to keep that in mind as we're writing our own issue descriptions. And sometimes when we open feature requests or file bugs, they can sit around for years. And if they're really, you know, controversial, they might have hundreds of comments in them. And so it's important for us also to treat the description area mm -hmm. as a living document as a living section where you might want to have a summary of what the conversation has been so far or what's going on. That way people don't have to read through 752 comments and try to understand what's going on, but they can get a quick sense of what's happening and then go into the comments to get further detail. So again, this is keeping in mind that everybody should just be able to jump right in. This next one is one of my personal favorites. It's yes and. And so basically it's instead of saying no or yes but, <laughs> which is a favorite of many people, just try switching it to yes and. So you can say something like, yes, I hear you and I disagree. So just by using that and, it acknowledges what the person has just said and it lets you still disagree. And so that makes somebody more willing to listen to you because they feel heard and understood, and then they're willing to try to hear and understand you. So it's a, it's a very powerful psychological difference. I really encourage you to start using it. And it's so cool that just one little word can have such a profound, uh, can make such a profound difference to to how we collaborate, you know, like that and can make somebody go from 
feeling attacked or like not listened to, to feeling heard and, and wanting to collaborate. And so collaborative communication, collaborative phrases are so important. Here's a list, you're welcome to screenshot it. And so an example, I won't go through all of these, but the very first one, how might we? Um, another alternative of this uh, that isn't as collaborative is we need to solve this challenge. It's a statement, it's, you know, saying we, so it's inclusive. Uh, but if you just change that to how might we solve this challenge, it then goes from kind of like a closed off feeling to more of like a, ah, I'm invited to participate. I get to give my input and my ideas. And so that one little switch again makes a huge difference. And a lot of these phrases do the same. I encourage you to read up on other ones that might help you too. All right, next section is navigating cultural differences. And this is really important as we continue to expand our communities and diversify our contributor base. Uh, this section is really based off of um, uh, the culture map, which is written by Erin Meyer. Um, she does research into this topic. And she's plotted out um, countries along these seven indicators, which are communicating, evaluating, leading, trusting, disagreeing, scheduling, and persuading. And while I don't have time to go through all of these, I'll cover a few. The first one is communication. Here we go, communicating. We have low context cultures and high context cultures. Low context value communication that is precise, simple, and clear. Oftentimes repetition is used to avoid misunderstandings. Versus high context cultures care about sophisticated language and nuanced, layered. Oftentimes you have to read between the lines. The next indicator is evaluating. And this has to do with how people deliver negative feedback. Direct negative feedback cultures deliver feedback frankly, bluntly, honestly. They don't soften them with positive uh, feedback or positive messages. And they oftentimes use absolutes. So things like you always do this or you completely failed, things like that. Um, and it's okay to be to give negative feedback in front of groups. On the other hand, indirect negative feedback cultures deliver the feedback softly, subtly, and diplomatically. They often use positive messages to wrap negative ones. So you've heard of the, you might have heard of the sandwich effect, which is positive thing. You give your negative feedback and then you end with a positive sandwich effect. And oftentimes qualifying descriptors are used, like you sort of do this a little bit sometimes. Uh, oftentimes feedback, this, this negative feedback is given in private. And so you can see how if cultures value giving negative feedback in different ways, this could be really problematic in any situation. And especially online where sometimes like other context is mix, missed with like facial expression or just in general, like uh, the physical cues that you get. So it's really important to understand that this difference exists and as we navigate these uh, different um, relationships and different scenarios when we're working in open source. This last indicator is persuading, and this is uh, principles first cultures value the why before anything else. They've been trained to develop the theory or the concept first before presenting facts, statements, or opinions. And applications first cultures value the how or the what first. They're trained to begin with the facts and the statements and then back it up as necessary. Um, and what Aaron Myers mentioned is that uh, somebody from France might get really frustrated if they're working with a manager from the United States, for example, that is constantly asking them to do something and mentioning the how and the what, but not really the why. Um, and so again, I, I just think that this is a really interesting indicator to know about as we consider how we work with, with others. 
And uh, lastly, I kind of wanted to show how this actually works by choosing an example of um, seeing where the KDEV board of directors is from or what cultures they might be uh, identify with. And I didn't consult all of the board members, I'm sorry, so this is just my best guess based on um, some information that I've been able to gather. So this is, um, uh, we have directors with backgrounds from Canada, Germany, Greece, Netherlands, Spain, and um, as you can see, there's a map of that visually on the right. We'll just choose the trusting indicator, which is kind of in the middle of that all. And you can see that some of the board members are from cultures that are task-based um, trust building, which means that um, the way that they build trust is by doing tasks with others. Like how well do you perform? How like can I depend on you from a work perspective? Um, versus there are some board members that are more from the relationship-based trust building, which they really need more of that personal connection and understanding, do others trust you? What else do you do in your life? Like what's the full person here that I'm interacting with. And so with this, it would be really great for the board to have both, to really work on building both types of trust, um, making sure that there are some social events where they can get to know each other over lunch or, you know, drinks or whatever it is. Um, and keeping in mind that others might build trust more through just working together and really like carrying out the tasks. So um, by looking at maps like this, you can start to understand the working groups or the, the people that you normally interact with and develop more empathy for the approach of everybody. All right, final tips. I'm almost at time. Um, the first is really to invest time in understanding the people that you work with. Don't make assumptions. I just kind of did in the last slide, but um, somebody may not identify it as the culture of the country where they were born or someone might look like they're from a certain culture but they may totally identify with a different one so don't make assumptions and then I think that it's okay to set expectations um, I've included a link below to check out GitLab's cross-culture collaboration guide which is what inspired this section of my of my talk um, but you know, in, in the cross-culture collaboration guide, they really mention, you know, GitLab values this type of communication or like this is the leadership style that we have. Um, and, and I think that's okay, but we need to also understand that as we're building diverse teams um, and having, for example, an interview process that really values low context communication, that means that you might be, you know, not allowing people from high context cult uh, communication cultures to be part of your company. So you really have to understand these differences and see how they're affecting our interviews, uh, our interviews and everything else. All right, and I'm going to end with this quote, which is communication works for those who work at it, a uh, quote by John Powell. And this really is meant to just encourage you to continue to develop your communication skills. It's something that is quite technical in nature in, in many ways, like there's psychology behind it and there, you know, it takes research to really understand how best to communicate. Um, and so uh, I think that by having communities where you're able to communicate well and you build resiliency into your program into your into your open source project because people are able to bounce back more easily by having that human connection uh, so that's it um, I'm at time so if you have any questions feel free to send me a message on LinkedIn Twitter at me on uh, GitLab um, and I'll be reading the shared notes doc later and responding there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nimriti. That was super interesting. And I hope uh, many of us will take some uh, interesting learnings from it. And yeah, uh, there are a bunch of questions in the shared notes. Um, maybe you can answer them in the chat uh, later uh, also. Um, yeah. And that concludes our second day of talks at Academy. Um, I'll sign up. I <laughs>